Um, for that side, we are talking about FFP. Right now, we talk about what do we do in the FFP cabinet, which we have in year one, year two, and year three. So, for a small MDU, we just basically you know manage two fiber EPFU or two fiber per customer connection. So we just terminate it as per treat it as you know a single dwelling unit on how we terminate it. Uh, but for a medium-sized MDU, then we need to manage all the trough fibers to the MDU, right? So how we manage it is by installing a new one IU shelf. So as what Phil talked about earlier, a one IU shelf you can you have two trays in it, and each tray has twenty-four termination. So we have forty-eight termination within a one IU shelf, and you need trough fiber per medium-sized MDU. Which means that in one IU shelf you can manage up to four medium size MDU. Okay? So we install that one IU shelf in a free space within the cabinet, right below the feeder shelf, or if you have a fixed fiber network, install right below the fixed fiber um, shelf. <coughs> An important thing we need to take into consideration is if the cabinet has air blown microduct coming up from it. Because for an air blown network, we do not install the shelf until we require the termination. Right. So in this example, you may require three three IU shelves, but you only have a single three IU shelf terminated today. Right. So which means that you need to have these two capacity as well for um, future expansion. So we need to take that into consideration. You can't install the one IU shelf down here because then you take up your space for your airborne fiber. Right. So what happens if the cabinet is full capacity? Then the feeder shelf is a 3 IU shelf today. So we remove that 3 IU shelf, replace it with a 2 IU shelf. So we have that 1 IU shelf space available. So as what Phil talked about earlier, the 3 IU and the 2 IU shelf, you have the side Slots, okay. yep. wrap, around slots. wrap around slots where you are able to remove the trays and take the trays out without breaking the fibers. Right. So the 2 IU and the 3 IU shelf has that wrap around slot. The 1 IU shelf do not have that. So that's the reason why you can only replace the 3 IU with the 2 IU. Okay. That makes gives you that 1 IU capacity for you to install your shelf for the MDU. Okay. <clears throat> yep, so basically this is just to show you, you know, what's the changes between the um, Moody i50 from the connectorized version to the spice version. Okay, on fireproofing for an MDU. So we've come across um, situations where um, the you know the installer goes to the MDU and find that in the riser, there's no fireproofing, or the or the fireproofing is not you know, up to standard. So what do we do uh, with it? Because according to the rules, the last person who goes in to do any installation is liable for the condition of the fireproofing. So which means that if you go in to install our fiber cable, we will be liable for it if it's not well stated, right? But Chorus is not a business to go out and you know, reinstate buildings up to standard. It's not our part of our business. <coughs> so what do we do? So if you go up to an MDU where <coughs> fireproofing is up to standard, so as part of installation, we have to break that fireproofing and install the cable. It's our responsibility to reinstate back up to standard if it's you know, reinstated um, in the first place. If you go there and find that it's not reinstated up to standard, um, there are two uh, conditions that the building owner will have to agree to. Right. The first option is the building owner agrees of course to go in to install the cable and leave it as it is, which means that we are not going to reinstate it. Right. The second thing is if the building owner agrees 
that after we install the cable, they will reinstate it up back to standard. Right? So if they agree with, with either one of that, then we can go in and install the cable. If they do not agree with it, we just walk away. We are not going to install any fiber to it. Yeah. Would we not require written confirmation before we commit yes, work? Yes, we will require written confirmation and that written confirmation will be obtained by the consents team. Okay. So as part of consents, they will have to agree to this. Okay. <coughs> okay. So if you have a scenario where you've got a 100, uh, 100 millimeter core hole yeah. going from one fire cell to another fire cell mm -hmm. with existing services in it, yeah. Okay, we'd be better off then doing a separate penetration and fire stopping our one rather than trying to fire stop this existing 100 mil penetration. Well, if that 100 mil fire penetration is already open, then it was actually cheaper for us to just install it through it if the building owner agrees. And then, and then fire. And then get them to do it, right? Because I guess so, so, as today, an, so as an installer, we need to be told whether yeah. we're whether we're reinstating. Fireproofing or not? Yeah. Because my understanding was any new penetrations we put in had to be fire stopped. Yes. But any existing penetrations we left them as we found them. Yes, that's right. So if there's no fireproofing, we then we don't fireproof. We don't fireproof it. Yeah. If the consent say that, right? The as the installer, we yes. need to be told this. Yeah, thing. yeah. So if the building owner agrees that we do not reinstate it, then mm -hmm. it's fine. We'll do it. If they do not agree to it. We walk away, we are not going to do that. Right, well, then we need to see something on our document yeah. telling us what we're doing. Yeah. So the consent team will have to yeah. provide you with that information. <coughs> okay, so on the campus type MDU, uh, probably it's quite difficult to say this or on the slide, but um, the same thing will be available in the um, deployment standard, so you can have a look at that. Um, for camp type, campus type MDU, we treat the whole campus as one single big MDU. So for example, in this case, you have two buildings within the campus, one with 24 customers and another one with 30 customers. So we just group them up together and say, it's a 54 customer connection MDU. Okay. Um, this will be the ideal case where we choose a main MDU where we can install your IFFP within it and then distribute from here to the next building. So we just treat it as one big building. But we understand that um, not all campus uh, infrastructure is like this, where you may have a scenario where two buildings within a campus, but each one has their own lead-in. Right. So in this type of situation, we just treat two buildings within the campus as two separate buildings. And each one will be dealt separately. So highly depends on what's the condition of the campus. Okay. And these are just uh, you know, a few um, examples of how do you route fiber within a campus MDU. So for example, it's a small MDU where um, you install two single wave ruby nets to a central location and then distribute uh, microducts to the adjacent buildings. Or in this example, a fixed fiber uh, network where you have 24 fiber cable going into a Goody 1S, spliced to a 12 fiber distribution cable to the next building. But in this side, we are doing a loop through rather than you know installing 12 fiber here and 12 fiber here, which means that you have to splice all 24 fibers. You only splice 12 fibers to go to that building, but you look through the fibers to this building, which means that you're saving short fiber slices. Right? Even, an even better scenario would be in this case where you install a 24 fiber cable to the furthest one side of the building and then keep on looping through to the next one. In this case, you do not need to splice in between. So it just saves a lot of work. For a medium sized MDU, once again, no. The lead in is a 12 fiber EPFU to a uh, central location, which, which is the booty I 50, and distribute it to the sites. Um, in this case, it's the same thing. Um, you have 24 fiber cable going to 
the 12 customer connection building, the 12 public cable building, the 6 customer connection building. And um, in this scenario, you have your main building on one side. Uh, same thing, you install a 48 fiber cable looping through the central building and then going to the next one. So take into consideration that if you need to do any loose tube, uncut loose tube looping through, you must install your Woody 1S box. Because if you were to compare the, um, the 1S box and the 2S, um, for the 1S it comes with a uh, looping bracket. So which means that you can have your cable coming in, looping your, your loose tube and going out. But for the 2S box, there is no loop through functionality at all. So you can't loop through with the 2S. Same thing with the large uh, MDU. You can terminate your main into a central main building and distribute it to the adjacent buildings. Uh, the important part of this is in the GPX shelf. So you have your GPX I-50, your cabinet. If the adjacent buildings also require the large shelf, you cannot do loop any fiber looping in the large shelf because once again they do not have the um, loose tube looping functionality. So in this case you need to install individual distribution cables to the adjacent buildings. Is that quite clear? Okay. So some additional information to you where for a large size MDU we need to uh, allocate 12 fibers for NBACs, which is non-building access points. For example, um, mobile backhaul service or you know whatever additional service that the building owner might want. And we terminate that 12 fiber at the highest point in the building into a Woody 2S. So we, for every um, large size MDU, for example, if you only have you know, 100 customer connection in the MDU, then we need to consider it as 112 because we need to allocate 12 fibers for n -bets. Um Again, THDU cable maximum distance is only 100 meter length. Um, management of the distribution ABF microduct in the GBX IFFP, you can only manage up to 144. If we need to engage engineering consultants, for example, if we need to drill through concrete walls or um, we need to find if, we, if um, the location that you need to drill is uh, possible or not, then potentially we may need to uh, engage engineering consultants. We have experience in um, Auckland where we had to drill because there wasn't any riser in the building and we had to drill through the um, cable stairwell. So we had to engage with um, consultants to make sure that, you know, our installation do not affect the structural integrity of the building. So, but we know that to hire consultants is an extremely expensive um, cost. So we have to go back to the local DS to make sure that they agree that you know we contact the um, consultants before we do the work. And after all um, fiber network installation, we need to perform network test and measurement. So you can refer back to um, document five five six sorry, 554, on the um, test and measurement document, uh, which basically outlines how we do the OT testing. Okay.